you know, this whole added sugar thing is it's just ridiculous. Oh. Sugar is sugar. A calorie is a calorie. Discussion over. And by the way, don't forget to order your Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens. What can green do for you? Um, no, I would disagree. We all know that sugar is like eight times more addictive than cocaine, so I will not be putting that stuff anywhere near my body. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to include a link in the description to my signature dewormer. If you use that link, I'll get a little bit of commission from it, so uh, please check that out and clean out your colon. Whoa, hey, the two of you, go out with the sponsorships. And I'm sure there's a lot more nuance to this whole nutrition thing than we're letting on here. Now come join my Patreon, mother- Fat phobia is all around us. Wally is one of the most fat phobic movies I've ever seen. Because the movie's entire premise hinges on the fact that the worst thing to come out of capitalism is that it made us all fat. I'm fat phobic. You're most likely fat phobic. Fat phobia is less a moral failing and more a foundation of our Western social paradigm. I know people hear fat phobia and they cringe some people because they're like, I'm not afraid of fat people. And it's not like that. I just want people to be healthier. Like, that's it. Like, I just don't think you should be a glorifying obesity. People should be healthy. As an official medical diagnosis, obesity is built upon the objective measurements of weight and height. Many point out that BMI is flawed, but what they really refer to are the labels we attach to BMI. There are some correlations between BMI and health. A 2010 meta-analysis showed a two-and-a-half to three-fold increased risk for diabetes associated with a BMI of 25 to 30, and a five to seven-fold increased risk for a BMI over 30 compared to a normal body weight or a BMI of 18 and a half to 25. Other studies challenge our conventional view of fat and health. Flegel and colleagues have shown both in individual cohort studies and meta-analyses that mortality risk is lowest around a BMI of 25, increasing towards both the so-called normal and overweight ends of BMI. Kira et al. find that 10-year risk for first-time atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease event, like heart attack or stroke, is fairly well calculated by the current PCE equations across BMI. These equations notably do not use weight or height as a variable, and the authors even comment that better metrics of obesity might identify discrepancies across a spectrum of body fat composition that isn't seen when using the BMI scale. Sometimes the scale even limits our visual perception of someone who may be unhealthy. Kalia Ketty et al. found that for South Asian peoples living in the UK between 1990 and 2018, a BMI of 24 had an equivalent correlational risk for developing diabetes as a BMI of 30 in white people. These minorities could then face lower rates of referral to preventative diabetes care since their body size visually fits the conventional definition of healthy. And that's part of the problem. Our common view of health is more of an essentialist one. These characteristics are healthy, those aren't. While there's merit to that perspective for certain diseases with more well-defined parameters, such as diabetes, blood pressure, thyroid disease, the overarching view of health we need to shift to with obesity and generally is a more pluralist one. Health as having the resources to live the life one wants to live. This reframes our view of health as a freedom from sickness to a freedom to do or be. We too often rely on our eyes to tell us what healthy is rather than evidence. And even when we turn to evidence, our focus on obesity as a disease drags with it a lot of fat phobic baggage. Because it's important the language we use reflect, as accurately as possible, our understanding of the world, I think we should replace obesity with a more specific term, maladaptive weight gain. Maladaptivity highlights the importance of the environment. Big plates, big portions, big advertising. Specifically the food environment in this process. When studying these negative health outcomes to determine health risks, we should focus on more specific diagnostic measures such as blood pressure, blood cholesterol, blood sugar, waist circumference, and even quality of life. When we understand the negative health outcomes of maladaptive weight gain in this context, we can begin to focus less on individualistic dietary considerations as the solution to the so-called obesity epidemic, and instead turn our attention to changes in widespread public yeah, dietary structures. Dunk and ice every time you push the button. I think that away from your gas tank. After a lot of surprises. Let's put a dunk and ice in every hand this summer. <laughs> but first, let's explore maladaptive weight gain with respect to another public health crisis. If we were to label the AIDS epidemic as the gay epidemic, then we would societally have a misunderstanding of the problem. The problem isn't that people are gay. The problem is that there is a widespread disease that disproportionately affects people who identify as gay. If we were to use the label the gay epidemic, 
then our solutions would aim to reduce gayness. Similarly, when we identify the problems created by our current food environment as the obesity epidemic, then our solutions look similar to the early 2000s diet culture. These sweatpants are all that fits me right now. A more accurate labeling then might be the excess calorie epidemic or the processed food epidemic. News stories covering this topic rather than filming random people walking throughout the city who we assume are unhealthy based on a two second clip and more specifically that if they are unhealthy, the cause is our perception of them as fat, should likewise focus on the problems with our current food environment which stand at the forefront. Instead, the news clips imprint the idea of an obesity epidemic in our minds using unsolicited footage of people and reduce our view of them to one aspect of their lives, making it difficult to appreciate the entire person. The point is you cannot know somebody's health just based off of looking at them, but it feels like we have this obsession with the idea of health, and I'm putting it in quotes on purpose because there are so many things that we do that counteract that idea. There are so many things that people that are not actually as healthy as they think they are do, but turn around and yell at fat people when it's like, you actually don't know what that person does on a daily basis. Furthermore, it's important to understand that BMI and thus the medical diagnosis of obesity is a surrogate marker for disease. Some surrogate markers are better than others, blood pressure and blood sugar give us a pretty precise picture of the downstream harm that these abnormal values can cause. BMI is a surrogate for percent body fat and not necessarily a great one at that. The argument could be made that with an increase in visceral adipose tissue, there is a corresponding increase in certain adipose hormones, which then go on to cause a deviation from homeostasis. But even then, an increase in BMI is not specific enough to tell us what components of weight whether that be muscle, subcutaneous fat, abdominal fat, are increasing, or what is causing that increase. It's wrong to look at a gay person as diseased simply because of the association between AIDS and homosexuality. It's also wrong to make medical assumptions based on BMI, attributing someone's health concerns to their weight. A better focus on the biochemical causes of maladaptive weight gain would help ensure that we don't define people's worth and capabilities by their visually assumed BMI. Before we look at how we currently respond to maladaptive weight gain, we need a better understanding of how diet affects weight in the first place. Broadly, we can consider two reasons we eat, nutrients and energy. Nutrition as a whole is an attempt to understand this complex process. For now, let's look at just the energy side. To do so, we'll need to understand the two most commonly used models of maladaptive weight gain. Both models consider changes in the food environment as the primary driver of maladaptive weight gain in the last 50 years. From this point though, they branch into separate explanations. Each is based on a different nexus point. For the energy balance model, it's the brain, and for the carbohydrate insulin model, it's insulin. Let's first follow the carbohydrate insulin model. The food environment change of importance to the carbohydrate insulin model is the low fat trend sparked in part by Ansel Key's now infamous seven country study in 1971. In an effort to lower and remove the fat content of foods, the food industry began marketing low fat foods. Chocolatey center Tootsie Roll Pop, delicious. And as always, low in fat while the public followed dietary advice to reduce fat intake. A somewhat unintended consequence was the rise of carbs, resulting in higher glycemic loads or total carbs times the glycemic index. Refined grains, potato products, and added sugar became more common. The carbohydrate insulin model proposes that this increase in insulin secretion in proportion to other hormones leads to a slow homeostatic return to baseline blood sugar levels. The brain, somehow sensing this low fuel level two to three hours after eating, sends signals telling us we're hungry again. So more food is consumed, and if that food is of a higher glycemic load, it creates a vicious cycle of overconsumption. The takeaway point here is that according to the proponents of the carbohydrate insulin model, overeating doesn't cause an increase in fat. Instead, an increase in fat leads to overeating. Proponents of the energy balance model, however, counter that this increase in relative insulin exerts multiple physiologic effects, which can't be simplified 
to decreased metabolic fuel in the late postprandial phase. How exactly the brain senses and responds to this state of so-called internal starvation, they say, is unclear. So let's look at the energy balance model. As I mentioned before, whereas the crux of the carbohydrate insulin model lies with insulin, in the energy balance model, it lies with the brain. But this isn't to say that weight gain is under complete conscious control. The energy balance model identifies several factors in the food environment driving the increase in maladaptive weight gain over the past 50 years. Increased availability, accessibility, and desirability. While the carbohydrate insulin model focuses mainly on carbs, the energy balance model points to a rise in convenient, lower cost, energy dense foods with larger portion sizes and large marketing campaigns. Notably, these foods are higher in fat and sugar, but lower in protein and fiber. Yet despite this nuance, the energy balance model holds that, from a purely caloric perspective, measuring one's intake and expenditure of calories accounts for the degree of fat gain or loss of a body. And while this controversial concept of calories in, calories out, may fail to perfectly explain energy partitioning within the human body, such as what calories get absorbed and where they go, it still provides a rough outline of the energy stored and used by our body. So, a uh, calorie, calorie is a calorie, is cal right? This is an oversimplification, assuming we can measure the amount of calories precisely in a given food, which we can't. All calories get absorbed from our intestine, which they don't. We could measure our body's total daily energy expenditure precisely, which we can't. And this measure is constant, which it isn't. And how our body partitions macronutrient calories doesn't matter, which it does. Because of all this imprecision built into SECO, some argue that it can't and shouldn't be used to predict energy storage and thus percent body fat. The energy balance model recognizes the imprecisions listed previously. But when looking at the data for net energy balance over time, the energy balance model asserts that energy surpluses, or calories in, greater than calories out, are primarily reflected in fat tissue storage regardless of diet composition. So while we may believe that a diet solely consisting of Oreos would increase our weight and a diet of strawberries wouldn't, theoretically one could consume more calories in strawberries and thus have a net positive energy balance. While also, theoretically, someone could consume only enough calories in Oreos to maintain a neutral energy balance. Theoretically. Unfortunately, SECO is often simplified into the individualistic recommendation to eat less, move more, suggesting that eating less is only a matter of individual willpower and not recognizing the increased availability, accessibility, and desirability of the food environment over the past 50 years. America runs on Duncan. SECO shouldn't be equated to the entirety of the energy balance model, but SECO should also not be tossed for its imprecision. Because it's hard to track exactly how many calories you're getting from a food, we shouldn't bother tracking it at all. That's like saying a budget isn't helpful for saving money. Do you need to have a budget to save money? No, you do not. You can save money without a budget. Is it very helpful for certain people? Absolutely. A great video on just this is Rebecca Watson's Why 1200 Calories Is Enough for Some People. In it, she explores how calorie counting can actually be used as a great way to better understand oneself and one's body through a scientific framework. The real issue with calorie counting is not its efficacy, as some would suggest, but instead the societal baggage attached. SECO aligns with an individualistic ideology whereby people must pull themselves up by their bootstraps and create the life they envision, advice often used as a tool for profit. The EBM therefore conceptualizes adipose tissue as an active endocrine organ evolved to dynamically coordinate the efficient storage and mobilization of energy, or triglycerides, in response to energy surplus and deficit, respectively. While this statement was made to support the energy balance model, it does well to characterize what both models try to get at. Adipose tissue is not some passive storage compartment. It's actively involved in how our body maintains homeostasis. A separate paper in support of the carbohydrate insulin model puts forth several dietary recommendations, which I wholeheartedly would agree with, including reduce refined grains, potato products, and added sugars, emphasize non-starchy vegetables, legumes, and non-tropical whole fruits. When consuming grain products, choose whole grain, maintain an adequate but not high intake of protein, 
and use a water filter and glass rather than plastic. Stico or calorie counting may be an accurate understanding of human dietary energy balance, but that doesn't mean it's the best method for everyone looking to affect their weight. Many of the carbohydrate insulin models dietary recommendations work, and the model rightly points out that calorie counting, while it may show efficacy in the data, can lack effectiveness in real world scenarios. Counting and tracking calories isn't all that fun. Ultimately, I'm less concerned with the differences between these two models. More and more we are discovering that tissues talk to each other um, and, and coordinate each other's function. So it isn't just the brain, it isn't just the fat, it isn't just the muscle. The fat talks to the brain, the brain by eating affects the hormone levels. And so the whole thing is a really complex interwoven network that allows the body to do these functions without things going very much out of control. And more with how our current food environment, whether through glycemic load or caloric load, impacts our health. Because we'll find that some of the solutions proposed by either side of this debate end up co-opted into a larger system impacting our health. And yes, now we're going to be turning our attention to capitalism. 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 Capitalism is a big word. Not so much in length, but due to the disparate number of ideas it invokes. A lot of people use the word to mean slightly different things, and often, at least here on left tube, those things are negative. So I want to start with some definitions to clarify what I mean when I say capitalism. While there are arguably degrees of capitalism, it's important to understand the role of individual profit as the driving force behind not just economic considerations, but moral ones too. Greed in the sense that people are not stealing from one another, but people are trying to get more for themselves. The invisible hand of the market provides little to no explanation for compassion, and instead proposes that by individually focusing on our own needs and desires, we can fully satisfy those of others. Some might point out that what I'm doing here wouldn't be possible without caps, you know, this whole YouTube.com thing. And they're absolutely right. My life is largely a product of capitalism. But this comes at the expense of other people and the planet under the same system. So let's start with some definitions. Let's first start with the foundation of an economy, and that is labor. As a particular economic system and the one that sits at the foundation of our society, capitalism is a mode of organizing labor that prioritizes the concentration of value into a thing so that it can be sold. In the picture here, we have the basic unit of the economy, the time and effort of the worker, as well as several other examples of concepts foundational to capitalism, which we'll touch on here in a bit. While labor is the foundational unit of an economy, the driving force behind capitalism is the commodity. The difference between a simple trade of objects and the more structured nature of capitalism is that the primary cause of the commodity's existence is the sale of it. While both the commodity and the objects of simple trade have a usefulness, the commodity comes into being because of the owner's desire to sell it and not for their personal use of it. This is an important distinction between a simple object of trade and a commodity and establishes the conditions where a object to be sold leans into appealing to its tangibility so that it can become more desirable to the buyer. Under capitalism, the reason a thing is desired as something to sell and not as something to use is because of the excess value it can provide. Excess value can result on the buyer or seller side. While the buyer might consider excess value a steal or just getting more value for the item than what they paid for it. Excess value on the seller side is partly what goes into profit. So in order for a seller to profit, they have to appeal to the senses of the buyer to make them believe that what they are buying is worth more than its value. The buyer is met with several instances of tangibility, which make them feel that what they are buying is worth more than its value. To the person buying here, they're made to feel happy about their cup of joy. They enjoy the convenience of a drive through that's open all hours of the day and night. These hours are most likely set by upper establishment and not agreed upon by the worker here. These examples are just some of the many tangible values used by the owners of this establishment to market their product, which fundamentally is just a hot drink. Price is what allows a capitalist economy to become foundational to society as a whole. 
price standardizes commodities and allows us to compare apples and oranges. In this case, instead of apples and oranges, we have a $6.29 hot drink, which we can compare to the $4.75 hot drink down the road. The last definition we'll go over here looks at what value the seller is after, and that is the time and effort of the buyer, which has been converted into a form to be exchanged. In this way, in maximizing their profits, a seller is seeking to maximize the acquisition of the time and effort of the public at large. The more profit they make, the more time and effort, or the more labor the owners can buy for their own personal use. Part of the seller's method in securing this value comes from the exploitation of the buyer's knowledge. In this video, we'll talk about how the buyer, by being unaware of the nutrient content of their drink and of the exact effects of this nutritional content on their body, fails to identify the harms and thus lower value of the drink. But we could also point to the knowledge differential concerning the working conditions of this establishment or the waste produced by it or the conditions under which resources are gathered to make this drink. So those are some fast and loose definitions that should be satisfactory for understanding my arguments here. For a more detailed explanation, see the first three chapters of Capital Volume 1. With an understanding of the world around us comes the ability to change that world, including ourselves. So knowledge ties in with power, which in the specific case of information about our bodies, gives us the ability to affect our health. Under capitalism, the value recognized in health knowledge becomes a commodity or something to be sold. If someone has knowledge, they're incentivized to view it as something of value to someone else, which it certainly is. The important part here though, is that value under a capitalist system is immediately seen as having an exchange value or price. Rather than knowledge being something I can freely share with others, I'm encouraged to see knowledge as something I can trade with others, so long as they provide me with some value of their own in return. I missed the part where that's my problem. Unlike a physical commodity whose value can be considered tangibly, the value of knowledge is completely abstract. I can't see, touch, hear, taste, or smell knowledge. Knowledge can only be understood. But this doesn't make for a good commodity, something dependent on sensory mediated exchange of tangible objects. The sight of a movie, the feel of a sex worker's skin, the taste of an apple, the sound of music. To sell knowledge then, capitalism encourages one to give it tangibility. For instance, we might see a medical certification or we might hear the word addiction. And new science proves that sugar is biologically addictive. In fact, it's eight times as addictive as cocaine. And feel the anger invoked in the blushing of our cheeks while imagining companies manipulating our biological reward pathways. But this tangibility is not knowledge itself, but knowledge adjacent. It allows individuals, companies, governments, etc., to manipulate and exploit our relation to this knowledge. Exploitation, like most things, exists along a spectrum, but it facilitates the sale of knowledge paid for by the buyer's income, their tangibilized or materialized human time and effort. To receive excess value from the sharing or sale of knowledge, that is, to receive more materialized human time and effort than one gives, the seller is encouraged to materialize this knowledge, to make it appeal to our senses. How then do we see health information materialized? We know that sugar is highly addictive. The literature shows that it is as addictive as cocaine. On YouTube, knowledge that was once only accessible by paying for higher education and or specialized trade programs is now accessible to anyone with internet, a device, and time. But YouTube is still part of a capitalist-based society and therefore encourages its owners to seek excess value. Highly addictive. Is sugar actually addicting though? Or is addiction invoked to instill a fear of knowledge and thus secure excess value in the knowledge provided to cure that addiction? Addiction is not as clearly defined a mental disorder as we would like to think. It's more like a syndrome a collection of symptoms constituting a recognizable condition rather than a distinct pathophysiology of the brain. To this end, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, Volume 5, places addiction under the umbrella of substance use disorder, a condition defined by patterns of repeated and compulsive substance use. There are 11 criteria used to diagnose substance use disorders and categorize them by severity. The most severe form of substance use disorder 
coinciding with six or more of the criteria is known as addiction. Analyzing my own relationship with sugar, I'd say I do consume more sugary foods than I'd like. I find myself buying Oreos at work, just buying it as a reward. When presented with a pack of Oreos, I'll tell myself, okay, only one sleeve. And 30 minutes later, the whole pack is gone. I continue to consume ultra-processed sugary foods, which I don't think is necessarily a problem when I'm sharing it with others, but is when I'm trying to avoid others because I'm ashamed of binging on Oreos. And I guess there's a possibility that the more Oreos I consume, the more I want. So am I addicted to the molecule sucrose? No. Might I be addicted to Oreos? Possibly. But to blame sugar as a substance and Oreos as a substance are two different things. You like sugar, huh? Is there sugar in syrup? Yes. Then yes! A 2019 article in the Journal of Food, Culture, and Society further explains this disconnect between addiction as understood by science and addiction invoked as a harm of sugar. The author states it would be inaccurate to characterize addiction as a brain malfunction divorced from its social, psychological, cultural, political, legal, and environmental contexts. Part of the characterization of sugar as addictive results from the cultural perception of its place in our body. Unlike dietary fat, which is widely but reductively understood as manifesting on particular parts of the body in visible ways, sugar is conceptualized as flowing invisibly through and around the body's structures and systems, including the brain, wreaking unseen havoc as it goes. But our conception of sugar addiction has simultaneously formed around the context of an obesity epidemic. The war on obesity provides vital context for the attribution of sugar addiction. Every war needs an enemy, and without the war on obesity, there would not need to be an attack on sugar, whose primary sin is its presumed role in weight gain. Further, the common view of addiction is built around an appeal to neuroscience, arguing that sugar activates the same neurochemical changes as addictive drugs, rendering sugar addiction plausible. They conclude, the rise in obesity coupled with the emergence of scientific findings of parallels between drugs of abuse and palatable foods has given credibility to this idea. To relate the addictive potential of sugar to cocaine is to recognize that they both stimulate similar brain pathways. But again, to reduce addiction to incompletely understood brain pathways is to fail to recognize the many other contexts through which addiction is defined. Additionally, the claims as to the addictiveness of sugar result from generalizations of scientific studies. Reporting follows similar patterns of newspaper coverage of science, adhering closely to the abstracted conclusions rather than engaging critically with the material, avoiding discussions of methodology, treating science as authoritative, generalizing attributions, and overstating findings, especially when they reaffirm social values. The first of these describes an experiment where rats, by pulling on levers, could choose between intravenously administered cocaine and water sweetened with saccharin, with the sweetened water proving by far the most common choice even for rats considered to be addicted to cocaine. The subsequent conclusions are cited as fact. French scientists in Bordeaux reported that in animal trials, rats chose sugar over cocaine. The claim that rats prefer sweetness over cocaine is frequently paired with a second study, which deprived rats of food daily for 12 hours, followed by 12-hour access to a sugar solution and regular chow. When the sugar solution became available, the rats would consume it heavily. This was followed by what were interpreted as symptoms of withdrawal, including anxiety, depression, and craving. These scientific findings are used as the premise for the logical conclusion that sugar is more addictive than cocaine, a conclusion which misinterprets scientific nuance and misunderstands our current view of addiction. Not a clearly defined disease with a hierarchy of addiction potential, but a collection of recognizable symptoms. With this claim, though, health experts can create a medical problem and then sell information on how to cure it via their online courses, diet books, dietary supplements, and trust in their take on the science. After all, if you're good at something, never do it for free. Or in this case, if you have knowledge, never give it away for free. Now let's shift our focus from content creators to advertisers. Here, an infographic from the Sugar Association explains added sugars. It correctly identifies that added sugars are what they sound like. If I have a strawberry, whatever sugars are in the strawberry, while molecularly identical to their separated glucose and fructose counterparts, are considered natural sugars. 
as the strawberry has been plucked from the ground already have in them. If I cover that strawberry in chocolate, however, then in addition to the natural sugars within the strawberry, I've now added sugars to the final product. The concern that natural sugars would be too confusing for people to decipher was one reason that for 20 years from its establishment in 1994, added sugar was not included on the nutrient facts panel. But why do we need to distinguish added sugars from natural sugars? Aren't they both molecularly the same? Sugar is sugar. Molecularly, yes. But this is how science can be used to mislead. Yes, consuming 200 calories of table sugar is the same calories in as consuming 200 calories of strawberries. And this is why calories in, calories out is not the entirety of nutrition, but a subset of it. SECO can be used to better understand the energy balance between diet and exercise, but this speaks nothing of the nutrient profile of food, only its energy density. For this reason, we can think of added sugars as empty calories, since they are caloric additions to a food product that don't add other macro and micronutrients necessary for maintaining the healthiness of our bodies. To the Sugar Association's credit, they don't try to make the claim that added sugars are the same nutritionally as natural sugars. But they do say three misleading things in this infographic to make their product seem better than it actually is. The first, which I'll admit is a bit of a nitpick, is the following. The dietary guidelines suggest a target intake of added sugars of up to 10% of total calories. Ironically, this appears in an info bubble right below a previous statement which reads, the dietary guidelines for Americans set a target for Americans to consume no more than 10% of calories per day from added sugars. Both statements appeal to the authority of the DGA, which we'll talk about more in a second. The first statement, however, suggests a target intake of up to 10% of total calories can be understood to mean we should target our intake of added sugars to 10% of our calories. While the second statement says we should consume no more than 10%. The first statement makes me want to aim for a total added sugar consumption of around 10% while the wording of the second statement leads me to believe I should keep added sugars as low as possible. This difference highlights the importance of precision in science communication. It can be easy to accidentally convey information supporting a biased conclusion. The second way this infographic misleads isn't via language construction, but language omission. The DGA does say a healthy dietary pattern limits added sugars to less than 10% of calories per day, but they also say the limit for added sugars is based on the following assumptions, including added sugars and saturated fat account for less than 15% of daily calories and no alcohol consumption. So for the person who consumes little to no alcohol and less than 5% of their daily calories in saturated fat, which is even more difficult than sugar because it's more calorically dense, that person could conceivably have an upper limit of 10% of their calories going to added sugar. In reality, the DGA admits that most Americans have less than 8% of calories available for added sugars. More nuance here than the 10% limit, or target, according to the Sugar Association, suggests. The third misleading statement from this infographic is not a matter of equivocation or omission, but rather one of incomplete evidence. The infographic states that this recommendation, the 10% added sugar limit, is intended to help individuals construct a balanced diet that does not exceed their calorie needs. And it should be noted that this target is not based on adverse health outcomes, which is true. The DGA doesn't say that this is based on negative health outcomes, although it doesn't not say that either. However, the American Heart Association does. In fact, they have a more specific recommendation of fewer than 100 calories of added sugar per day for women and 150 for men, which would equate to less than about 6 to 7% of calories. This 2009 recommendation admits that although the mechanisms are unclear relative to other carbohydrate sources, sugar intake appears to be associated with increased triglyceride levels, a known risk factor for coronary heart disease. In 2014, however, there was a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine showing a higher percentage of calories from added sugar is associated with significantly increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality. Specifically, the study uses prospective cohort data from 11,000 people in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey from 1988 to 2006 to show that sugar consumption between 10 to 25 percent of daily calories correlated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease death and that above 25% with over twice the risk, even when factors such as age, sex, race, education, smoking status, and many others were similar. So when the Sugar Association says in 2023 that added sugar recommendations 
aren't based on negative health outcomes. They're relying on the fact that we don't have randomized controlled data where one group is exposed to an increased amount of added sugar over a long enough time period to detect negative health outcomes, in which case what they say is true, but this is an incomplete truth and one that serves to benefit the public's perception of their product. The DGA goes on to state that added sugars account on average for almost 13% of total calories per day and that the top four sources of added sugar in the average American diet, sugar sweetened beverages, candy, desserts, coffee, and tea account for 63% of added sugars. So most of these added sugars provide palatability to foods and drinks with little added nutrients. The idea the Sugar Association promotes with its infographic here is that added sugar can be an appropriate part of a balanced diet when used to increase the palatability of nutrient-rich foods. The reality is that most of the Sugar Association product goes into foods and drinks that are effectively junk. And if we can spend 10 minutes analyzing the dubiousness of one infographic from the Sugar Association, is it not hard to believe that the desire to prioritize their product over the health of the public at large is baked into everything they do as an organization? A recent Fox News video explored sugar from the production side, reporting on the company U.S. Sugar's operation in Florida. The video highlights the many hardworking problem solvers involved in the industry, but when you look at the vast fields and all the heavy, expensive machinery used, you can't help but see a microcosm of the harm that capitalism incentivizes. All this land, natural resources, and human time and effort is being spent to produce empty calories. Land, resources, and labor that could be used to feed the entire community surrounding that Florida sugar plantation is instead going to make something that no one really needs, but which fetches a high enough price on the market to justify its existence. This is what is valued in a capitalist mode of production, and it comes as a direct trade-off to other nutrient-dense food that could be valued instead. Sugar may not be addicting, but as a commodity, it's much more desirable than something like a bell pepper. But the Sugar Association is not just selling knowledge. A tangible product can itself be manipulated to increase its exchange value. As far as manipulation of value goes, there is no greater example than slavery. With slavery, the buyer of labor gets it for free and then turns around to sell that product of labor for a profit. In effect, the slave master is stealing human time and effort. Slavery, of course, ended like 200 years ago, so we wouldn't call working 12 to 14 hours for two US dollars slavery, but instead forced labor. Indeed, these were the allegations brought against the US sugar supplier, Central Romana, whose products include Domino Sugar. When you get paid only $4 or less per ton of sugar cane caught, uh, you're forced to work for longer times. So you're forced to bring your, your family members to help improve uh, your survival income. And, uh, and yet, they, they don't have minimal conditions for, for living standards. No running water, no electricity. U.S. Customs and Border Protection banned imports of sugar from Central Romana in 2022 due to accusations of slavery-like conditions for its workers in the Dominican Republic, many of whom were undocumented Haitian people. The abuses included the unlivable pay mentioned above, as well as denying workers their pensions, forcing 60- and 70-year-olds to continue working long days in the field, all while the two brothers operating as the CEOs of Central Romana live out their lives in Florida as two of the 756 United States billionaires. In the case of these two businessmen, their wealth is tied to the value taken from the people working on these sugar plantations for 20 cents an hour. What could these workers and their families' lives be like if two billionaires gave up just half their money and distribute it among the people? To be clear, the Van Hool brothers would still have $500 million an ungodly amount of money that likely won't be spent in their lifetime. All while the money and the life that money could buy for someone working near slavery conditions is left as ones and zeros in the stock market, forever going up, but providing value to who? This is a stock exchange. There's no money you can steal. Really? And why are you people here? Now let's look at a way knowledge is exchanged in our society that isn't necessarily based on seeking excess value. In 1990, Congress passed the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, 
giving the FDA the authority to require nutrition labeling on food. The FDA decided to add total but not added sugar to the label, yet did not include a daily reference value or a disqualifying amount of sugar when making health claims. They were concerned a reference value for sugar might limit intake of natural sugars in nutritious foods, yet still included a cholesterol limit despite it being found in nutrient-dense foods. Around that time, American intake of total sugars comprised about 50 grams or about 10% of a 2,000 calorie diet, a level which even the FDA cautioned against exceeding. Fast forward 10 years and our added sugar intake alone reached 98.6 grams or 17.9% of a 2,000 calorie diet. Throughout the 2000s, we got varying but notably smaller and smaller added sugar recommendations from different organizations. The Institute of Medicine recommended less than 25% in 2002, and by 2009, the American Heart Association recommended less than 5% culminating in the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommendation of less than 13% for added sugars and solid fat. By 2016, almost 30 years after the passage of the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, the FDA finally mandated that added sugars be included in the Nutrient Facts label and also total sugar listed on a front of pack label. The FDA doesn't include added sugars on the Nutrient Facts label to get us to buy one product or another but to provide health information to the general population. This characteristic uniquely places information provided by the FDA and other nonprofit-based organizations in a different and arguably less biased light than that of a company selling something. Yet, despite this free health information provided by the FDA, it still took over 20 years for us to get just one line of information on our food packaging. If we consider this situation more broadly, even this win comes short because it still requires a considerable amount of background health literacy to understand the different components of the nutrient facts label, and even more to combine all this information into a single decision about the relative healthiness of a particular food. If you've ever seen this voluntary front of package nutrition label, then you understand the problem. The label above does little to communicate the relative nutritiousness of a product for the majority of people shopping for food. So why not shift to more interpretive labels in steering people towards healthier food options? You could argue that if I'm going to buy something like Oreos, the healthiest option is not really what I'm looking for. But in the case of salad dressing, an interpretive label might help me and society as a whole select the healthier option, especially when what I previously thought of as healthy turns out not to be. And beyond individual consumer choices, front of package nutrition labeling can combine with other policies to produce a synergistic effect on public health. In Chile, for example, products with one or more warning labels can't be marketed to kids, and children learning about these front of package nutrition labels in schools can then influence parental decisions on what products to avoid. While it's disheartening but unsurprising to see the U.S. has done little to begin even formulating front of package nutrition label policy, there is a precedent for the U.S. to act on dietary improvements for the general population as seen with the large-scale removal of trans fat from the food supply. Time will tell whether we can overcome our own ego, read lobbying by multinational food corporations, and work towards a standardized front-of-package nutrition label as seen in other countries. Speaking of multinational food corporations, responding to Mexico's front-of-package nutrition label, Nestle decried it for radical restrictive labeling required for mostly all products. They support front-of-package labeling promoting reformulation towards healthier products, yet if they recognize their products should be reformulated, why not just go ahead and do it? Like an MMA fighter dehydrating themselves before a fight, they really can't afford to, or else they won't remain competitive with the rest of the market. Nestle also cautioned against the use of stop sign shaped labeling that would create unnecessary fear in consumers, indicating the food should be avoided. But that's the point of the labeling, isn't it? To steer people towards healthier food options? But of course, the most egregious crime here would be disallowing the use of intellectual property to help sell their product. Unite the seven. Woo! With any policy, we should consider unintended consequences as well as the actual effectiveness of said policy toward accomplishing the predetermined goal. Aspects such as label design, size, and placement and the written text all have an impact on how the public will interpret and incorporate the information into their dietary considerations. The guideline daily amount, for instance, the one we've all come to know here in the U.S., was originally developed via the cooperation of the U.K. government, corporations, and consumer groups before being introduced in 1998 and spreading throughout Europe and Australia. 
studies comparing it to a more interpretive traffic light label show it to be less effective, and the traffic light label has in turn shown to be less effective than stop sign warning labels. Front of package nutrition labeling, the FDA and organizations like it, are not the, but a solution to a shift in our perspective on dietary health. Another solution comes from us, the public, as we have some decision in who to buy from. Throughout high school and college, I was told and believed that buying local is just a marketing gimmick, something to give small businesses a leg up in a large international market, that from a view of productivity, local products are less efficient than ones shipped from 8,000 miles away. But buying local is not just a marketing gimmick. It's a recognition of the lives and resources in one's physical proximity. This isn't a claim of moral superiority, it's a recognition of the negative externalities of alienation. Despite the interconnectedness of our global community, there is only so far any one person's attention can spread. By focusing more of our attention on those in our community, we lessen some of the issues caused by multinational corporations which, because of their size, will inevitably have higher levels of exploitation. Exploitation of natural resources via increased shipping, exploitation of other communities that become dependent on the company's wealth and power rather than developing their own, and as we have seen here, exploitation of the knowledge gap between themselves and the people buying their products. It also seems unavoidable that the more we spread the power of our income among companies, especially those local to us, the less overall exploitation occurs. We may pay just as much or possibly more for a product made in our community, but to the extent that we're each able, we have to stop seeing the most productive companies with the best prices as most deserving of our income. This isn't to say that there's no alienation or exploitation occurring between the local business owners and the people they employ or the resources they use. It's more like a rule of thumb, like the nutritional advice that shopping the perimeter of the grocery store is better than shopping the aisles. Part of the appeal of nationwide chains and food brands is their uniformity. And so to end this video on individual people making the right choices about how to conduct our society is idealistic and often co-opted by large companies whose interests serve to make us feel like we're making the right decision and taking our attention away from solutions which have a larger impact on society. We still need collective action aimed toward mutual benefit and not individual profit. The contracts with the soda pop companies are ordered released by Ontario's Privacy Commissioner. They showed the money Pepsi gives the school board in exchange for pouring rights amounts to about four bucks a student a year. A great deal for Pepsi. In the aftermath, Ontario bans soda pop machines in elementary schools. The Dodds can take a lot of credit for a battle won, but not the war. Coke and Pepsi are still firmly ensconced in Ontario's high schools, also selling water and craftily named fruit drinks, which are just as sugar saturated as pop. Some may believe that companies pursuing their own self-interest is a more pure, rational, and morally acceptable form of creating a society than a kid working to get soda machines banned in his school. But policies that restrict the freedom of companies can be an effective solution to the societal inertia created by complex, multifactorial problems. To argue that banning vending machines from schools is a restrictive intrusion of government is to fail to see vending machines as an intrusion on our health by the food industry. Shifting our focus from individualistic dietary advice to mutually healthy nutritional structures serves as a microcosm for the changes necessary to promote healthier living for ourselves, for our non-human comrades, and for the planet. Capitalism, as seen in the exploitative conditions generated when seeking excess value, does not hold equally the health of all actors. By shifting away from this profit-driven foundation, we can move towards a society founded in solidarity. The world, what a glorious place. Seek freedom and it will lie stretched out before your eyes. If the endless dream guides your restless spirit, seize it, raise your flag and stand tall. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
All right, I'll go cook the burger. Oh, wait, okay. Woo! <laughs>